It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 299 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 3rd of June, 2018. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. And on the show today, we'll be talking about vitamins, very old trees, magpies, and some astrobiology. But don't forget, if you like what we do, you can support us by going to scienceontop.com slash donate, where you can choose a level on Patreon. Every bit helps, no matter how small or big. We're very grateful to all the generous supporters who have chipped in so far. Now let's start with a look at vitamins. In 1942, journalist Robert W. Yoder wrote an article in the popular health magazine Hygieia that was the first record we have of the term vitamania being used. And vitamania continues to this day with studies showing about a third of Australians regularly take vitamin supplements and more than half of Americans. Now, a new study published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology reiterates what dietitians have been saying for some time now, Penny, that most vitamin supplements have little or no benefit and some can in fact be doing harm, right? Yeah, and I found this quite interesting. So I guess my personal thing towards vitamins is I always think, well, God damn it, Penny, just eat a freaking healthy diet. It's not that hard. But then I think, what very hard on yourself. <laughs> so I take a multivitamin. And obviously having had kids, as you know, it's very intensely pushed that you need to have a pregnancy vitamin and blah, blah, blah for folate, among other things. So I was like, okay. I don't feel that pressure. <laughs> you didn't feel that? Well, you no. probably get a lot of folate generally, so uh, you <laughs> need to supplement yeah. that. So, uh... so I guess I always thought of vitamins as like, I guess the insurance policy model, like I'm trying to eat a healthy diet, but if I'm not, they might fill the gaps. But I thought this study was really interesting because if you look at the benefits of vitamin and mineral supplements for prevention of heart disease, stroke, and just premature death in general, it found that the most commonly studied ones didn't have an effect on this, while the less common ones sometimes had an effect, but also that some supplements could be harmful. So this particular study was a systematic review looking at all relevant research papers that they could find. It looked at vitamins A, B1, B2, B3, B6, B9, C, D, E, beta carotene, and the minerals calcium, iron, zinc, magnesium, and selenium, and multivitamins that included most of these. So finding for common supplements, D, calcium, vitamin C, there was no reduction in incidence of heart disease, stroke, or premature death. And the article that I read, so this means there was no benefit from taking them, but also no harm, which is something I'd like to discuss later because I was wondering if there was benefits to taking vitamins and minerals that don't necessarily reduce in you living a longer life, but perhaps improving the quality of life you have in our brief kind of time on this planet. But the ones that did have positive impacts on early death were my old friend uh, folic acid and folic acid showed a reduction in heart disease and stroke. So the calculation was in order to prevent one case of heart disease or stroke, about 111 people needed to be taking folic acid supplements. So I guess if, if 111 people took it, then one person who would have had a stroke or a heart attack otherwise would not. So That sounds great. Folic acid is something that I remember taking for pregnancy. However, there are some cautions, especially there's a concern that perhaps high levels of folic acid in the blood might increase the risk of prostate cancer. And also some of the studies were done in China. And the difference between China and Australia and the US is that in Australia and the US, there's a folic acid food fortification program. So when we buy breads and breakfast cereals, they're already fortified, whereas China doesn't have a similar thing. So yeah, I don't know what that means. I'm not a nutritionist um, and don't really understand. 
I guess um, the other thing that was found was that there can be some adverse effects. So those who was taking um, statin medicine to lower their cholesterol, vitamin B3 could actually increase the number of early death by 10%. So that with a number needed to harm of 200. So if 200 people were taking their medicines in B3, we would see one case of early death. So in a way, on an individual level, that sounds quite low. But given the number of Australians and Americans that take dietary supplements, I think 29% of people in Australia reported having taken one and about 50% of people in America take them. It could have quite large effects. And I guess what it all means is what I sort of always knew is that you can't kind of supplement your way to a healthy diet and isolating one individual vitamin and saying, oh, you know, if it gives you that false sense of security, I don't need to eat an orange or fruit because I've had some vitamin C. You're missing out on all the other health benefits of that fruit and all the other plant compounds that we might not even fully understand how they work and how they interact. But the other thing I did think about, though, was that surely some of the rationale for taking vitamin supplements isn't to live a longer life but to just improve your quality of life while you're around. So I remember when I was younger I used to take magnesium supplements because I had terrible cramps. So maybe you could and they helped or they seem to help. I don't know. I haven't looked into whether that, you know, it was a placebo or not. But I mean I guess you could argue well, you know, I should have just eaten more foods that were high in magnesium. Well, that's all well and good, but we don't always get the chance to, and we all have very busy lives in that where we often don't get the right amount of food and the right quality of food. Because yeah. And often we put it on the back burner. It's not a priority for us. We've got everything else to worry about. And so I, I, do, I do wonder because I feel like the headline was a little bit vitamin study finds they may do more harm than good. And it's true that, you know, they may not help you live a longer life, but I wonder if... I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say. (laughs) Well, I think also a lot of the marketing around them is, you know, are you feeling tired, stressed? Well, you need this. Well, this wasn't looking at whether or not it can help you sleep better or reduce tiredness or reduce stress. It was only looking at those health benefits, heart disease, stroke, that sort of a thing. Yeah. I mean, I was picking up a bottle that was, um, I didn't buy it in the end, but it was marketed as improving, you know, the quality of your hair, skin and nails. Like, That's a real aesthetic kind of goal. Anyway, I thought it was interesting. I I guess it's kind of, it's not a shock for me because I do feel that a healthy diet is optimal and it's good to know about possible harmful things. But yeah, I, I would like to see a study like this maybe not just focusing on early death, but it'd be nice to know if it actually is worth taking these supplements. I mean, they're not cheap. You... I would like, I would prefer to have, to be able to think that my diet is always so healthy. But as you said, I mean, some days it's like spaghetti bolognese and bread and you don't see a leafy green vegetable, (laughs) you know? So, yeah. Yeah. I think the other interesting thing was that uh, one of the most studied supplements was vitamin D. And so when they looked at that, they found that there were no benefits for heart disease or stroke prevention. There was also no harm. But they found that surprising because vitamin D is often recommended for a whole host of conditions from diabetes, various cancers, things like that. So there was no benefit from an early death point of view, but also no harm at usual recommended doses. I mean, there have been cases of people having, instead of, you know, your 1,000 IU, they've had a 10,000 IU uh, pill because it was manufactured on the cheap in China, wasn't regulated well enough. And they've overdosed from things like that. But that's a rare thing, obviously. But uh, I guess the the standard advice that I think a lot of uh, health professionals have been saying for some time is eat a healthy diet as best you can. You probably don't need to take supplements unless you actually have a deficiency and you've been tested for that by, you know, a GP and a pathology test. But for the most part, erring on the side of it's there, I can have a multivitamin you're probably not going to suffer too badly and it might do you some good. However, we are not doctors. No. And you should definitely consult with your healthcare professional. Absolutely. Don't listen to anything we say when it comes to health. No, certainly not. Except for the bit where we say talk to your GP or your health professional. Yeah. (laughs) 
Lucas, uh, when we think of life on other planets, a lot of us will think of the proverbial little green men in their flying saucers. But in reality, if there is life out there, it's probably going to be bacteria, the extremophiles we often talk about. But earlier this year, a group of scientists published a study in the journal Astrobiology demonstrating that we should instead be focusing on viruses, since they're the most common form of life on Earth. Now, Lucas, there is some debate among microbiologists as to whether viruses are technically life, but I don't think that should detract from the point that these scientists are making, should it? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the interesting thing about this study is, is and, and this, this proposal, it's, if you like, is that although, yes, viruses are, are dependent upon life, they're dependent on cellular life to multiply and do what they do, they do have a coexistence with life. So in terms of as a, as a marker of life or as, a, as an indicator of life there or, or life has, having been there in the past, they're kind of pretty useful in that respect. So there are things called virions, which are um, basically a, a virion is, is like a um, – it's sort of like the – think of a virus that, that hasn't yet become a virus. It's like a potential virus. Protovirus. If you like, yeah. It's, it's kind of like a it's, – it's a thing that basically is, is – everything a virus needs to become a virus without being a virus yet, and it hasn't, you know, it hasn't been activated. It hasn't become – it hasn't, you know, got involved with, uh, with cellular life yet. So there are – Lots of them. <laughs> there are a staggering amount of them. From my reading uh, um, this week, it's um, they drew the uh, um, the example, or they, they made the example that if you were to take a teaspoon of, of seawater, that teaspoon could contain up to fifty million virions. That's a lot. That's a lot of virions. <laughs> yeah. So it's an insane amount of virions. <laughs> nice. I like that reference. Um, special points to any of our listeners who get that reference. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so so it's an interesting thought to say, okay, could we look for virions as a way of inferring life and inferring potential viruses and inferring, therefore, interactions between viruses and, and cellular life? I'm not going to go into much detail about what they're where they fit in but it's really interesting that they're proposing that you could for example put instruments on future missions that could for example sample the ice plumes from Enceladus or from from Europa which we've discussed on the show many times and to look for these traces rather than microbial life rather than looking for you know bacteria and that is an interesting thought but the challenge is that finding these things on earth usually involves an electron microscope they're really small they can be really really small you know in the in the sort of nanometer range so given they're very very small those instruments have never been deployed on on spacecraft before something that's looking you know into such a small scale but if you consider that these things outnumber life so significantly on earth and and yet are, st are still indicative of it of it in many ways or the potential of life then they're certainly an interesting target to go after it's really a, a there's very much a, a technological and engineering problem as to how to deploy instruments that can that can look for them that said engineering problems can be fixed you know what i mean so we can engineer our way through those problems so it would be interesting to to go looking for them at the moment there's no missions that are looking for viruses at all and this is actually one of the points that the this article made that um, astro virologists have basically said look NASA, we should be considering viruses as well, not just normal biological indicators. We should be looking for viruses because, they're, they're, you know, as I say, they're, they're very numerous. But where you're able to directly sample, such as the, the ice plumes from Europa or Enceladus, that gives you a, an opportunity that you don't really get in other ways because when it comes to bacterial life, and, and other forms of cellular life, they tend to leave indicators on the atmospheres of planets. I mean, we've obviously we've only got a sample of one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we know we know that um, Earth, for example. I mean, oxygen is a great example, right? So, oxygen without life replenishing it would basically bond to things and and uh, or or drift away. It doesn't stick around. It likes to bond. So, uh, the existence of of oxygen in the atmosphere of an exoplanet is is very 
that's something that we really want to see because that would re- that would be really really telling of life because that oxygen is being replenished or being created effectively well, not created but you know what I mean it's being being expressed into the atmosphere if you like and we can we can get to that because we don't need a, a probe to be right there at the planet to see it we can use spectra to figure out that there's there's oxygen in an atmosphere we just need starlight to be passing through the atmosphere of the planet and then we can take spectra we can measure the difference and we can look for those absorption lines and so forth which which indicate that there's there's various things such as uh, oxygen in the atmosphere but the viruses we can't do that we're not currently aware of any ways to infer the existence of of viruses or or virions based on the effect that they have on things around them so the alternative that they've proposed here is there may be some things that we can study more on earth that indicate changes that viruses have or cause to life form which then in turn change the way that they interact with the atmosphere if that makes sense so it's an interesting thought experiment, I think, at the moment, more than anything else, because we don't have anything that can do it. But it is, I think it's important to note that you can become a little bit, I guess, tunnel visioned in, in the way that you're looking for life. And we base everything on expedience on, and, um, and what we can detect. And that, that really is the key right now. These are the things that we can easily detect. But things change so fast. And if we're not thinking about other options and other possibilities, we could miss something that's really obvious. And if you just think about, it, just even in the time that we've been recording this podcast, not tonight, but I mean since we started the podcast, in that time, the advances in, in planetary science and, and particularly planet hunting are just staggering. You know, it's just amazing to, to have seen that happening. So if, we, if we're not aware of these potential indicators of life and other, other types of life to go to look at, then, you know, we, we might miss some opportunities. So I think that was the takeaway from me that, you know, it's a case of, well, let's just keep this on the back burner or something that we, sh- we need to be aware of, but also fund studies on Earth to look at how viruses might affect life here, which then are measurable in, in some ways of their interactions with the atmospheres or their environment around them. So, yeah, interesting, interesting uh, study. It is. I think the other interesting thing uh, to think about with viruses, of course, is that if we do find evidence of viruses or even virions, on Earth, viruses are pretty integral to a lot of life forms. Their DNA has sort of become embedded in existing life and they do a lot of that horizontal gene transfer that we've talked about a fair bit. So if we do find evidence of virions or viruses, that in itself is an indicator of the possibility of cellular life as well. Exactly. Exactly right. And, you know, there's a very much a symbiotic relationship between cellular life and viruses and, on this planet. So, so yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we, we kind of expect that if we have one, we probably have the other. All right, NASA, throw some of that spare money you've got loose uh, towards viruses and uh, virus <laughs> studies. <laughs> Well, of course, it doesn't have to be NASA. We can do this on Earth, at, you know, at the grad, you know, student level. You know, this is this is someone's potential thesis that they could be doing. So, yeah. Sure. Good point. Okay, Penny. Speaking of Earth, the Polino National Park is the largest protected area in Italy. And among its many treasures is Europe's oldest dated tree, a craggy pine nicknamed Italis. How old is it, Penny? And who's the poor PhD student who had to count all those <laughs> rings? Good questions. It's 1,230 years old. So that means it started to grow in the medieval period. It's gone through warms, little ice ages, and it's currently living through a period of global warming and climate change. So it's an seen old, it all. old tree. <laughs> the stories it could tell. The, oh, the things it could tell. <laughs> the things it could see. Except it probably hasn't seen that much because one of the reasons that it's managed to survive for so long is that it's in quite a remote and isolated area in a national park. So it's not been living somewhere where it's a great place to farm or graze your cattle and so on. Anyway. Two interesting things about this tree. One is it was actually quite tricky to date. It wasn't as simple as getting some poor student to count 1,230 rings because it's so old that the centre of it was essentially dust. 
the trees kind of trees aren't like us they kind of their living bit is on the outside so their bark and so on it's one of the reasons why you can why a goat or someone could kill a tree by ring barking it and the inside of it is there but it's not really functional for the tree's life so it sort of decays from the inside out this particular one has decayed from the inside out obviously that doesn't happen to every single tree because otherwise you wouldn't be able to cut them and get they'd fall over yeah but this <laughs> one it has so it wasn't as simple as counting rings 20 centimeters of tree was missing which is a lot of growth a lot of rings and also for this tree again trees are not like us like if you see a picture of it it doesn't look, it's not exactly kind of verdant and bursting with life. Like bits of it are alive. There's branches that are growing, but bits of it really, really dead looking. So the sense... Not, 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 to be, not to be insensitive, but that seems to be fairly true with humans as well. <laughs> <laughs> fair <Just> fair point. <laughs> <laughs> so... It's also um, the central part of it, which would really have the oldest bits, were not, was not around either. So how to find out how old it is, it's a new method that combines different existing techniques. So you can count the annual rings and you can count the trunk rings or you can count root rings. So The roots have rings? The roots have rings, but they don't yeah. sort of one-to-one correlate to growth rings of in the trunk so it's not as simple as just going oh you can just count the root rings instead but what you can do is um do some radiocarbon dating of its roots which will help to determine when it germinated you can then use that information to cross date the ring growth in the roots and the trunk to find out what was going on with the missing trunk so i think that that's quite impressive finding out a way to date this tree with stuff missing and it's also like i'm sure it's not a common problem to have to need to know the age of a tree that's rotten in the middle but you know it's nice to be able to combine different things it's also interesting because this tree has been thriving despite a lot of changes and apparently a lot of trees in the mediterranean experiencing a decline in the growth under current conditions this one has thrived It could be because it's in a little microclimate. It's, in fact, growing, having a growth spurt right now, which say it's better, with better conditions. It might be because there's been a decrease in pollution in Europe due to recent laws and so on. Well, yeah, it's lived through the Industrial Revolution as well. So there would have been a period of time where it had severe pollution, like the days of the Industrial Revolution with all the coal being burnt in, in all the cities to, to just run heaters and stuff. Even what we're talking about with the Romans and the lead pollution, you know, in an episode. Yeah. Yeah, like, so there's been, although, the although it wasn't coin. around then because it's only <laughs> a thousand years old. But, you know, just, um, yeah. I just thought this was really interesting. It's interesting also to think that trees can effectively be immortal. They don't age in the same way that we do. In fact, one of the reasons that they die is usually from external causes, like they get blown over or um, someone chops them down or, you know, something else. Conifer trees tend to live the longest, but that's partly because they remain smaller. They're less vulnerable to extremes like droughts and storms. But if the conditions are right, yeah, the, a tree can live for a long time. So I thought that was kind of cool. It's, um, I don't know, there's always this fascination with oldest and biggest and strongest and smallest, but I'm not going to lie. I'm not different. I find this stuff interesting. Well, we should note as well that uh, this is the oldest in known Europe. tree in Europe. Yeah. I mean, there are the Great Basin Bisselcone Pines in California and Nevada, some of which are more than 5,000 years old. Yeah. So that's a lot more rings to count. <laughs> but I kind of like that mix of the two technologies and dating methods. And I think it'd be interesting to see how they would go comparing some of the previous record holders and dating some of those trees. So I just always, I always love it when there's a new system comes along that can be used as a verifier on a older technology or something like that. Additional sources of evidence. It's very cool. Now, Lucas, we haven't done a COVID story for two whole weeks now. <laughs> so let's talk about the magpies that live near airports. 
that have gotten so accustomed to aeroplanes that they no longer fly away from them. This, I guess, could be a good thing or a bad thing. Yes, I've discovered in myself now that apparently I like magpie stories because I keep, I'm, I'm continuously drawn to them. So, I mean, they're pretty cool. Birds are cool. I think the more I see about birds solving problems and stuff like that, the more, the more I wish I worked with them rather than <laughs> people. But, <laughs> well, they can learn for starters, which, oh man, a lot of people just don't seem to be able to learn. But anyway. Okay, so this is an Australian study, this one. They're looking at, a team uh, was looking at, um, basically, that there's been a lot of bird-related plane incidents, way more than I realised uh, over the uh, this period. Hang on, I'm just looking for the actual number. Here we go. So the Australian Transport Safety Authority reported 513 magpie strikes between 2006 to 2015, which is only 5.9% of a total of 8,707, sorry, 717 strikes over that period. 8,717 strikes between 2006 and still, we never really figured out how to say 2000 and something, did we? So 2006 and, and 2015. That's that's way more than I realised in lot. Australia. That For those who are afraid of flying, I would still not be too afraid. This is still a very safe means of transport, that's given a lot how many strikes. flights and there are. But, yeah, but in 10 years or nine years. Sure. I mean, well, I guess we're lucky that, that magpies, which are, you know, one of the, the more common species to be struck by commercial airliners, are, um, are smallish in when it you know comes to the sizes of birds that are out there in the rest of the world that could be sucked into an engine, such as and this article in fact does mention uh, this is on the conversation it does mention the events we, we probably most of us most of the listeners probably remember the the event when the um, U.S. Airways plane landed on the the Hudson River in New York after basically ingesting some some geese shortly after and they made a movie about that which was a Tom Hanks movie uh, Sully so that was amazing uh, it was a good movie actually a lot I really enjoyed that but um. But yeah, these these things can cause problems, and obviously this is one of the one of those uh, scenarios that pilots do uh, train for, is because it is quite common that aircraft can ingest birds into their engines. But this group has actually done this study. Where they're looking at whether the birds become habituated to the aircraft takeoffs and landings, and whether or not that habituation is a good thing or a bad thing. And funnily enough, the jury is still out on whether it's a good thing or not. And this comes down to the, the response that the birds have to, to a threat. So birds typically will respond to threat by uh, initially becoming a little bit more vigilant. They'll pay more attention to what's going along around them. And then they, if the threat, you know, remains or, or escalates after, you know, becoming more vigilant, they'll then start to say, okay, we've got, we've got to bugger off. So they'll either fly away or they'll run away if, if it's a smaller threat. Like think of you're driving along the road and there's birds on the road. Sometimes the birds jump up and fly away sometimes they just run to the side of the road they kind of they assess it so they they're they're very aware of their their surroundings but what this group have found that they studied some some magpies that were uh, locals to the area around uh, point cook so near the the raft base in in point uh, cook in victoria which is where the the air show is uh, each year that raft base there has got this this population of magpies that lives there. So they studied these magpies and basically they played them soundtracks. I don't know whether they put little headphones on them or what, but they played Please them soundtracks. Please tell me it's highway to the danger zone. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, man. They were in little leather flying jackets as well. Um, <laughs> so they, they planned the soundtracks of, of landing uh, aircraft and, and taking off aircraft. And what they found was that these particular birds weren't particularly fussed by it. They weren't bothered by it. They didn't show the the the, <laughs> the flight response. <laughs> I was going to say fight or fly, <laughs> but they're not going to fight. But they're just going to fly. Whereas they did the same things for for birds that lived in other areas, and those birds had a much more uh, severe reaction to it. And they tended to be more disturbed by the takeoff sounds than the landing sounds, which makes sense because takeoff your your engines are at full thrust. Whereas landing, your your engines are not at full thrust, and you're basically slowing down and deploying flaps and all sorts of stuff. So it makes sense that that you know it'll be a lot louder for takeoff. But the problem is takeoff is is really the most vulnerable time. So if you've got birds that are that are skittish and that take flight in fright, then takeoff is the time that you're probably the most vulnerable. 
And that seems to be the time that you're going to scare the birds the most. So initially, there was some speculation, and, and it seems that they've not resolved this. It was unclear whether whether this you know makes them more likely to be involved in the collision or less likely to be involved with collision. And they, they haven't really come to a conclusion about that yet, which is really interesting. It's going to be one of those things that more more studying is going to need to be need to be done to figure that out. I kind of my gut tells me that it makes sense that if these birds that are living in around an airport are, uh, are are not as bothered by it then they're not as likely to take flight but the the converse of that of course is that if they're already in the air and they're not paying attention to the aircraft that's behind them <laughs> because they're so used to it then they're not going to get out of the way but then again and this is one of the things that this there but then that but then this and and on the other side of it is Apparently, they've done studies and looked at the impacts of these birds, and I, I can't imagine how because there's not going to be much left of the bird, but apparently, they normally, the impacts are to the rear of the bird. They fly away from the aircraft, so they're like, oh my god, there's a plane. I need to fly away. Oh, it's really hard to fly away from this plane. <laughs> Because it's going fast, but they don't fly sideways. They don't go, oh, I'll just go down. It's going up because they don't know that. So it's still, it's a case of, well, for these reasons, it might make sense that it's better to have birds that are habituated. For these reasons, perhaps it isn't. So definitely more um, studying involved. Did you know, I only learned in reading this story, but did you know that there are certain techniques that they routinely deploy to remove the threat of birds around airports. I did not know this. Apparently, they do this this thing that they call hazing. They haze the birds to try and basically get them to move along. It's kind of nothing to see here, move along. Do they end up like strapped to a boom gate naked yeah, or something? Yeah. <laughs> It didn't go into a great. <laughs> it didn't. It didn't go into a great deal of uh, detail as to how exactly they haze the birds. But my impression was that they try and you know move them along by making life a bit uncomfortable for them. It says they harass the birds to scare them away. They harass. <laughs> yes, they harass. There's Constantly calling them up and sending letters. <laughs> Just send it. They just get harassed by telemarketing calls all day long until they just go, you know what? And Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't realize this story was going to be fun um, like to talk about. But anyway, yeah, so they, they actually do this. Um, so now maybe, maybe we shouldn't be doing that. Maybe we shouldn't be harassing the birds, hazing the birds to get them to move on because we want the birds that, that are a little bit okay with it. But then again, maybe those birds are just, just going to get run down. But then again, if that happens, well, they're not going to be around long enough to get used to exactly. it. Exactly. So- As you say, they learn very well. They're good learners. So the ones that don't learn to get out of the way of the planes – they don't last very long, and the ones that do will then propagate the species and so on. The other thing that I thought of it being a good thing that they are not as fussed by planes is it could just be that it's it's lowering their stress levels, it makes them calmer and will live longer sort of thing. So it could be a good thing from their general health point of view until they get ingested by the plane. Yeah. At least that's not a, a sort of a long-term yeah, illness. Yeah, it's quick, it's painless. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's quick anyway. It might be painless for a very brief amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Maybe. So there you go. We don't know. We don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but they do learn, they do adjust their uh, responses, and we'll, I guess we'll have to wait and see what comes of this. So we'll follow it. I will pledge to follow this story for you. And in fact, Ed, you sent me a link of the researcher behind the story that we talked about last time on the show, which was the creepy mask lady going into the park, holding a dead bird, and seeing all the other crows just freak out. And then when she would walk in there, they're wearing the mask without a dead bird. They have associated her freaky, freaky face with danger. It turns out she answered some questions on YouTube about exactly this, about this mask. And, and yeah, the masks were, I think that a lot of people were, were quite disturbed <laughs> by, by how, how freaky, the freaky these masks mask. were. <laughs> yeah. That was because they were originally from another study several years ago where they wanted to know if the birds could recognize human facial expressions. So they had to have masks that were sort of completely expressionless, sort of poker face mask. The drawback to that is when you put it on, it essentially looks like you're wearing somebody else's face, a very emotionless face, yeah. Yeah, she did mention Silence of the Lambs in her response, which I think I said during the story as well. So Yeah, and that's our show. 
As always, you can find all the links in the show notes or at scienceontop.com slash 299. Don't forget, you can always help us out by going to scienceontop.com slash donate. But the best way you can support the show is by telling your friends about it, especially through social media. And thanks for joining me today, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Time to choose a Flintstones vitamin, Chris. Mmm, I'll take Barney. Hey, Chris! <laughs> Glad you could make it. Wow, it's you and Fred! Yep, the most famous men <laughs> in bedrock history are carved out of this mountain. And here we are at the foot of Mount Rockmore. Let's get climbing. That was close. Come on, Barney, we're almost there. You know, Mom, just one Flintstone each day gives kids all the vitamins they normally need to take when they don't eat right. Ah, what was that? Yikes, let's get out of here. Run for your lives. Chris, you'll be late for school. Yabba-dabba-doo. Yabba-dabba-doo, they're good to chew.